Thank you for joining us today for the Grant Basics webinar, helping teachers and principals secure additional funding for classrooms and schools. A motivating factor for me to present this uh, webinar is to help to demystify how grants work and how to get them. And I do this because I think educators are born grant writers. Uh, you've written a lot of papers in college. You've written a lot of lesson plans. You organize classrooms uh, and school activities. And you have a passion to elevate students and families to be more successful in school and our community. And I want to help you harness these attributes to help bring new opportunities to your teachers and students. Uh, the purpose of this session today is to share with you some common grant proposal elements and to provide you with some strategies to graph to draft a grant proposal to improve conditions in your classroom or school. Uh, if this session is being recorded, so if we go over something quickly and uh, you need to kind of revisit it, just access the recording and you can. This recording will be posted on ESU 10's uh, YouTube channel. And uh, of course, uh, if you need to have any questions, you are be more than happy to contact me and my contact information will come at the end of this show. Uh, a little bit about me. Basically, this just says I should know what I'm talking about. Uh, and I'll just kind of skip over that. Uh, what are grants good for? Grants are great at launching new programs, expanding successful programs, or um, improving existing programs. But uh, I provided an example down here of a STEM program. So here's an idea that might be grant worthy. So I have so many students that lack opportunities to develop STEM skills and to learn about STEM occupations. And uh, I wanna see grant funding to provide additional robotics equipment so students can develop STEM skills and connect to local STEM professionals. That could be the uh, beginning of a grant proposal. Now, what are grants not good for? Grants are not good for maintaining the status quo, um, just buying textbooks to replace older ones, getting stuff such as just getting computers for assessments. You're not looking to make any condition change among students. You just want to keep, keep what you got going. Uh, in, in place of traditional fundraising, like bake sales or magazine sales, or funding ongoing programs. Uh, funders want to make a condition change, which is usually why grants have an evaluation element in it, so the funder can see the impact of its dollars uh, on the target population. For example, there was a, a principal that had a, a program going on in her school, and she would come back year after year saying, I need grants for this program, and I would say, are you adding anything new to it? She would say, no, but I need funding for it. Well, you know, we, are, we got a grant for it for the first year, but if you're not gonna add any enhancements to it, I can't, you know, I don't think we'll be very successful. We pursued funding, but nobody wanted to take it because it was funding an existing program. Now, sometimes when I talk with teachers, they are very fearful or apprehensive about grants because they're not familiar with them. Um, and they uh, think that it's gonna be a huge imposition of time on their time. So in order to kind of conquer that apprehension, let's take and try and link it to something that is a very familiar context and that's a lesson plan. Because you've written lesson plans in the past or probably you're still doing so and you've reviewed them. And so if you can write a lesson plan or a college paper, you can write a grant. And so what I did is I took uh, these eight elements of Ma the Madeline Hunter model of mastery learning and looked at the eight common sections of a grant proposal. And I tried to see how did these match up? And as you'll see from the arrows, uh, a lot of what is written in a grant or in a lesson plan transfers very easily into a grant proposal elements. You can pull things straight from your lesson plan into a grant proposal if it's something that you're looking to add to 
uh, an activity or classroom activity that you're doing. For example, uh, the anticipatory set, you know, introducing a topic or a, an element uh, in your lesson plan. Same thing happens in a grant proposal. You're introducing the challenge, the problem, in order to grab the reader's attention to read forward. Now, if you go to a grant writing conference or a session, what they will talk about a lot of times are need, project design, management, and evaluation. And then they'll skip down to budget, which is fine because those uh, five elements are common in a lot of grant applications. But I always like to include these three in the grant proposals that I work on because it helps to differentiate my proposal from others. And that is on a timeline, I try to show a sustainability plan and my plan for sharing how success will be shared. And I try to put that in my grant proposal because I, I think that really helps to differentiate my proposal from others. Here is uh, the, the grant strategy that I use. This is a what I call a proactive grant strategy um, because this is what I use to provide the foundation for it, pursuing funding opportunities. So what I usually do first is I work on developing an outline and I share it with those that are involved in the project with me. So if I'm a teacher, I'll share it that with my principal, or if I have other teachers that I'm working with, I'll share it with them. Uh, because people can critique and review an outline easier than a full blown narrative that uh, takes them more time to read. After I develop my outline, I research funding opportunities that align with my outline. So um, this does a couple of things. It helps me rule out funding opportunities that I don't want to pursue. So if there's something in that funding opportunity that I like, but I don't want to pursue it, I know right, right away that I can get rid of it. Um, it also helps me to identify the funding landscape. So for example, if I'm writing a STEM grant that has, um, that has a makerspace approach to it, so I'm looking for funding to develop, a, uh, establish a makerspace in my school, um, and I find a funding opportunity that'll pay for the makerspace, but also includes partnering with a post-secondary institution, and that's not something I really wanna do, then I know I can get rid of it, but also it introduces me to what funders are looking for in STEM, in the STEM landscape. So do I wanna provide a partnership with a post-secondary institution in my grant? It's a question that I can look at. Um, and need to address. Then I develop my grant proposal template. Uh, once my outline has been reviewed and approved and modified, depending on the grant search. And then I send that up for approval either to a principal or superintendent. Um, and once that's approved, then I can use that to modify and apply for multiple funding opportunities. For example, I uh, wrote uh, five grant applications in one afternoon on a STEM grant uh, using my template and, and uh, applying it to multiple funding opportunities. Once I do that, then I make sure I track submissions because grants sometimes have a very long lead time. You can you submit a grant in October and you may not hear about it until February or March if you've been selected for funding. Thank the funders, especially if I've been selected for funding. Uh, establish a, a process to automate data tracking. Uh, Google Calendar is great for doing that, just to set a reminder. I make sure I provide the reports as needed. A lot of grants, especially for classroom grants, they're looking at um, doing simple uh, end of project report, which could be, did you spend the money? Did, could you accomplish what you said you were gonna accomplish? What was your biggest challenge? What was your biggest success? And that's, those are usually the four things they ask for in a, in a report. And then thank the funders with pictures of grant funds and actions. Um, you know, with everything being so digital nowadays, especially with STEM, uh, you, a lot of the grant applications you'll provide will be submitted online. Um, and so you can email the funder or something, a picture of students using the makerspace that was funded by their grant project and they'll like that. 
So, uh, and that is important because you're establishing a relationship with a funder. Uh, so a funder may provide a $500 grant to help you buy some uh, uh, replacement parts or something like that for a STEM project. But in another year or two down the line, you may be wanting to go to them for a $10,000 grant or a $50,000 grant. And if you can maintain that relationship with a funder, uh, that will be going a long way to you being more successful. Here are a couple of common tips for completing uh, proposal sections. And I, I have two that are just standards. Uh, the first one is request for proposals, always rules. Uh, you may develop your grant proposal template and think you know what you're doing. And then you read a request for a proposal and they want things in different orders and different ways and different languages. If it's a, per, uh, a funding opportunity you want to pursue, then you just have to modify and put it in the format uh, that the funder wants. So you may not, it may not make sense to you, but if it's a funding opportunity that you think you can complete, uh, compete in successfully, you just have to go with how that RFP is structured. Second tip is to know thy reader. In grants, once you submit your grant application, there's usually two um, standards ways that your grant application is then handled. One is a person, one person will end up reviewing and reading your grant. So if you're applying to a local family foundation, usually it's just the executive director or somebody or program officer at that foundation is going to be the one that's reading it and then recommending a slate of proposals to their board of directors to approve. Uh, some grants, uh, they will have, they will assemble a panel of experts um, to review grants and to make recommendations for funding. Uh, so why is this important? Well, if you know that only one person is going to read your grant and they may not be familiar with STEM concepts like STEM skills, what those, what does that mean? Um, you know that your application has to be in very plain English that your mom and dad could understand. If your application is going to a panel of experts to review, then they may know what, if you mentioned STEM skills, they may know what that means. So you can up the jargon a bit in those kinds of proposals because you know that they are in this, they live in the same world as you do. But if it's just a, a small family foundation that's reading it, then you know that you're, you have to cut back on your jargon and use just plain English. Uh, here is a discussion about the need section. Uh, this is when you start to tell your, your story and you look at this and you look at the need section and that's where you introduce the setting. So you wanna talk about your school and community char uh, characteristics especially those that relate to the condition. So if you know in your community that STEM occupations are gonna be in, in demand and expected to grow dramatically over the next 10 years, that may be how you wanna start your need section. This number two, numbers tell a story. I always tell, this is like painting by numbers. You wanna show in hard uh, black and white numbers why this problem, is, this challenge is in your community. So you're gonna look at assessments. What, have, what do your assessment scores show from last year? Is there a trend of uh, declining performance, student performance in a particular standard uh, or assessment over the, you know, have you seen that students have decreasingly scored poorer in math assessments over the last three years? Uh, that's where you can talk about that. Demographics. What are the demographics of your school? You have to assume the funder, even if it's a family foundation, local one, doesn't know your community. So you have to impress upon them how your demographics, your poverty rates or um, uh, ELL rates or something like that, how those are impacting your school and your students. Um, and other socioeconomic characteristics. The new census is out and the new census has demographics by school districts included in it. So you can look up uh, the number of uh, single parent families in your school district. 
because that could have an impact on your student's ability to do homework at night, for example. Uh, so you want to talk, look at those. And why you're able to make a change. This is an opportunity that you can show why you are the knight in shining armor. Uh, what's the background of the school or your classroom? How long have you been teaching the subject? Uh, experience with addressing the condition. Uh, you've been teaching for 10 years, five years. You have experience with it. Have you received any honors or recognition? This is where you can brief, briefly talk about that. And then there's the hook. This is usually the last paragraph of the need section. And that's where I try to sum up everything in a sentence or two that I presented earlier, and then show how the, the funder and you or me can work together to change the condition. Project design. This is a table I put together and sometimes I use this as an outline of sorts uh, when I'm working on my proposal because it shows visually how my project is going to run. And so I'm, I'm gonna put my goal together, make sure that my objectives are in alignment with my goal, look at my activities, make sure they're in alignment with my objectives. Evaluation, make sure that they make sense to the activities. I put a timeline together, which um, uh, shows how I envision the program operating. And then who is responsible? If I'm the teacher, I know what I'm going to be required to do. If I'm having to share this with my principal, the principal knows what his or her responsibilities are. And then it's important when you're developing your outline, if you have a technology need that through tech, your techie is going to, your school's uh, technology professional is going to have to help with, then Techie Ty knows that in August, he's going to have to be, or she's going to have to help with uh, software upload. So this is sometimes uh, when I'm working on a grant proposal template, template, I'll put this in at the very beginning of my project design section. Um, and then I explain if I'm purchasing curriculum, like reading curriculum or STEM related curriculum, um, why is that evidence-based? What performance is it shown in the past? Um, and then uh, it also helps the reader because when you're looking at reviewing a proposal, if I can come back and see in a table, very simple constructed table, what your project is and what it's gonna do, then I can visualize it better and connect to it better. Management, who is managing what? You, as a teacher, you are a manager. So what are you going to manage? What's your experience in managing? So you can talk about your teaching experience. Uh, uh, are you a sponsor for anything? Uh, what has been uh, your experience with that? Because the outcome of this is you want to provide confidence that the project can be successfully managed and accomplished, that you have the capacity to do what you said you're going to do. Evaluation. Sometimes when I talk with teachers, they're very apprehensive about grants because they think they're going to have to do a bunch of new things. And evaluation is usually one of those things they think they're going to have to do. Most of the grants, especially for classrooms um, and smaller and small school grants, basically they're going to ask you to use what you're currently doing. So we look at your current assessments and most of, especially for state assessments, you're doing pre and post. Uh, because of COVID, a lot of assessments haven't been done. So I go back to when they were done, because unless demographics in a school have dramatically changed over the last couple of years, um, prior year assessment results are sufficient. I also look at, is there an opportunity for me to use uh, a survey to show student beliefs or opinions about a topic before or and after the activity. And Google Forms is a great tool for doing that. And then I try to use a mix of quantitative and qualitative strategies, um, just so I have an even base of it. And then it's, I always put that a timeline can be used as a, an evaluation tool um, because you can share with them, you know, I expect to purchase equipment in August, um, unfortunately, because it COVID or other conditions, I wasn't able to purchase it till September. Um, or if you can say, hey, we, we did everything in our timeline that we said we were gonna do. And so we have a 100% success rate with that uh, element. 
timeline. When you're looking on a timeline, make sure that it is consistent, that it is, uh, if you're gonna use a monthly timeline, make it monthly throughout the time of the grant. Uh, or if you're gonna do a quarterly, keep it quarterly. Don't go, don't start with a, a monthly timeline and then switch over to quarterly, that's too, too confusing. I try to sync it to normal operations. School years run from August to May. So if I can, I sync it to uh, you know, purchasing items in July, making them available to students in September, and then um, running with it from there. Make sure that your proposal is consistent with the RFP. The RFP says that uh, applicants should expect programs to start in October. Then I know I need to modify my timeline to be consistent with that. Sustainability, and this is one of the bonus sections. This is uh, where you show that the grant can continue after the funding has ended. So um, when I'm looking at sustainability, I'm looking to see how program operations like evaluation and time will be continued. How will consumables be replaced? So school budget can be a source of sustainable funding. Uh, a PTO or school fundraisers can be a source of sustainable funding. Other grants, and I put an asterisk there because this is viable only if the project is being enhanced or expanded by adding new features or spreading it into other classrooms. So for example, if you're writing a STEM grant and phase one is purchasing uh, robotics equipment or computers, and phase two is, um, providing paid internships to students uh, with area STEM uh, companies, then uh, that phase two is something that would be uh, grant worthy. Um, and I would use that, put that as part of my sustainability plan. If training, if teacher training is involved, um, that is an ongoing a sustainable effort. And so a better trained teacher equals uh, improved student learning outcomes year after year. Dissemination is another element. This is sharing success with others. If you're uh, doing website, Facebook, or whatever, you're already doing social media stuff, that's a natural dissemination tactic. Um, invite uh, teachers or schools to come into your classroom to see your project in action. Uh, if you've done a whiz bang project and it's uh, pretty impressive, include pre presenting it at the Nebraska Education Technology Association or NEDA uh, would be a good uh, dissemination tactic. And then budget. If it's mentioned in the narrative and it's a cost point such as curriculum, tablets, or teacher training, then it must be included in the budget. I know some reviewers of grants will look at the budget first and then uh, because that can be kind of an outline to them for what's being proposed. And then they go back and read the narrative and see how they match up. Now, a question I often get asked is uh, how strict do we need to be in adhering to the budget if we get selected for funding? Um, because remember, you may su submit a grant in October, but you may not hear about it until February or March. So funders know that prices and products change between the application submission and the award. If you find the price of a project has increased, you'll need to adjust your budget and share it with a funder to get the funder's approval. If you find a price has decreased and you're able to either purchase more of that item or can apply the savings to another budget item, um, then come up with a draft budget revision and share that with the funder before you start spending the money on it. Um, funders normally are very understanding as long as your budget and uh, changes are still steering you towards the goals and objectives, then they are very amenable to um, budget changes. If you start seeing your budget going in a bad direction, which it shouldn't, then uh, before contacting the funder, come up with a solution to the problem, contact the funder, and then present your solution. Um, that helps. Uh, One page proposal worksheet, uh, you will have access to this. 
This is just a worksheet that I use to, um, and I encourage you to use it if you're a principal, to use it with your teachers, or if you're a teacher, use it with your principal to show them that, hey, I've thought this through. This challenges you to answer some questions that will be helpful to you in writing your outline or uh, in addressing um, your grant search or other things, your budget. Um, you can read these. I've, I've provided an example of different responses. Um, I think, I, in fact, I used a, a STEM related uh, activity to do that with. And these those are in italic. So I just showed a draft response that I, I would use um, just to give you a, a way to kind of jumpstart your thinking process. When I get done with the proposal, I'm looking at the 12-12-12 rule. And that is, this is the poor, poor program officer at the end of a 12 hour workday. They're finally sitting down at night, at midnight, to review a stack of proposals uh, that they will be recommending to their board of directors the next day. And this, and I wanna make sure that my proposal, which is the 12th in the stack, is different from everybody else's. So when I get done with the proposal, I want to see, am I, is this my proposal easy to read and understand? Can they follow it? Um, and is my information or graphics, if I'm putting any tables or charts in it, are they impactful to somebody else who's reading it? If you have any questions, feel free to get in touch with me. Uh, here's my contact information. I'll be happy to respond. I can help you with research. I can help you with reviewing your grant if you want another set of eyes to look at it. Uh, I can help with budget development um, or just another set of ears or eyes um, to you as you're working on your grant proposal. Uh, this session, as I mentioned before, is available for viewing on ESU 10's website. I have done a literacy grant for uh, a special uh, session on literacy grants and because there are certain tactics for literacy grants that are different. And so if you want to look at that, I will also be doing one next week on STEM grants in which I will be presenting a uh, additional tips and tactics that are unique to STEM. I also include an outline example of a STEM grant that was successfully funded and spreadsheets that contain uh, STEM funding opportunities for classrooms and schools. These are ones that you can go out and look at today. For example, the uh, Bayer Foundation or the Bayer Fund has a uh, funding opportunity that's out now that if you get nominated by a farmer, um, you could be up for a $5,000 grant from them. All you have to do is tell Bayer how you plan to spend the money. And boom, you've just been given the the foundation for doing that. Uh, if you want access to any documents or anything else, please contact me and I'll be happy to give you uh, access to that information. Thank you for joining us today and I look forward to helping you in the future.